Okay. Decided I'd leave the, the full title there just to freak people out, so, um, or the full introduction. So, my name's Gavin Henrik, and I do weird stuff with people who want to use Moodle. And one of the things that we, they often ask me is about competency frameworks. And, well, this presentation is actually going to be you deciding what I present, because competency frameworks are fun, weird, and sometimes quite overwhelming. So, what is a competency? Well, lots of people define it really differently. Some people define it as a skill at which someone has to excel. Some people define it as a metric which people are used. And it, it really sort of, uh, it needs to be discussed in context. So, what I've got is, I've got all of these examples which I'm going to talk through. I've got 20, 25 minutes, so let's say we'll do 20 minutes. I'm going to choose three of these but you're going to choose two of them. So I'm going to do the last one, which is the Masters of Pharmacy. So um, hands up, how many people want me to go through the first one, the key competencies for sales representatives? One, okay, that's good. That was from 2003, it had four levels, pretty scary. What about the world-class sales competency model? Nope. Um, put your hands up for the ICE competency model. No. Okay. What is ICE? What is ICE? Okay. Let's, we'll start off with that one then. There you go. <laughs> okay. So, one of the key things in the last five, six years that competency models have started doing is identifying that people are different, to some extent at least. And so organizations often will have a set of competencies that all of their staff should have. And they call them core competencies. And then some of them will go, well, actually, after that, then they have their speciality or functional ones. And the ICE is that. So it's the Intercontinental Exchange, where they have lots of exchanges. And they decided that these are the core competency areas or domains that all of their staff should have. And all of this sort of stuff is available online, and I'll put this presentation into the Moodle site afterwards. So if you then just take one of them, and so how it becomes a framework is you've got these different levels. So in just under teamwork, you then have stuff like here, offers assistance to colleagues, or fosters friendly and cooperative relationships. And that's sort of one level, I mean, it's, it's quite an interesting one, that these are core, and if we just jump back up. So they break it down into communication, teamwork, professionalism, and then problem solving. So most jobs are going to have those. But then it, it, you have to recognize that different functions of the business are going to have different requirements. So for example, if you're in operations or if you're in sales and marketing, and these will have different skill sets or requirements for that particular role. So if we take one of them, product development. So then they break that, that area down into three sections, technical knowledge, productivity, quality, and design and innovation. And unlike their core set, which was quite light, they go another level again. And this is basically having a domain or a top level area, a competency, and then what you'd call behaviors underneath that. So when we go into design and innovation, and you see then they, they're getting more specific. Now this is like obviously here, um, identifies and effectively applies emerging technologies. So these are really, really key as to how somebody actually operates in their job. But can you get a grade in that? I mean, how do you start assessing those kind of things? Um, and that's one of the challenges with frameworks. And each framework um, is completely different in that respect. So one of the things I really like about this, this framework is the fact that it breaks it down into business areas. So that each business area, apart from those four initial ones, can be very specialist and recognize that their staff and the things their staff need to do are fundamentally different. So has anyone got any thoughts on that? Do you like the way that's done? Do you dislike the way that's done? Okay, fine. Right, before I actually go on, probably should have asked this at the beginning, who here uses competency frameworks in their organization currently? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay. So, it is starting to be much more popular at government level, in financial um, sector, within a lot of the business and sales, marketing, and especially within the medical area. So I'll just jump down to the next example, take you through it. So 
Technology is one of them. Now, competencies, apart from being used within an organization for basically assessing whether somebody is good at their job or what they need to be good at their job and identifying training gaps, because that's primarily what it is. Here is a dartboard of 20 different things and competencies you should have. You're missing three of them. That's where your CPD or your continual professional development should be. And that's one way competencies are used. However, equally, competencies can be used for your whole curriculum and competency-based learning. And that's this example. So if we look here, it's Virginia CTE Resource Center, and it's their very recent published um, framework. And here you can see, wow, they've got a lot of sections for a start. And it goes through quite a lot of different things, and because it's a full course we're talking about, and it, it really is comprehensive. And if we just take one of them using web technologies, they, again, they're going down that one level. And you can see here that they're talking about explain how, evaluate, develop. These are more functional rather than some of the others. We're within a, an organization frameworks which are used for sort of post-learning, for the assessment and ongoing evaluation. They're more holistic in how they view things. Because then you can go down into the next level, so here, with the first one, explain how to locate resources and references. So what they do then is they define how that competency can be attained, which is different to what a behavior is of what you expect to see from somebody. Because So this one here it literally does specify how the teacher will decide whether that student has attained the competency. And, and that's a, an interesting one. So how do you decide that? Well, how they look at it is, is the level of, level of competency for that. So can they teach others? Can they perform without supervision? So this is it's, it's move, a movement away from just grades into can someone actually do this job that they're being trained to do or do this individualized task. And I really like this one to a point because I feel that it would be much better if that had been broken apart into a, a sort of a higher level as well and, um, and grouping these up a little bit because I think this is a little bit flat. Although you've got exploring programming concepts using algorithmic procedures, I think I'd like to have seen this breaking up at a, a sort of a higher level because then you could go for core and then specialist depending on what area of programming they're actually going to be looking at. But again, what do people think of this type of competency framework, which is then used for sort of tracing your learning as, you go, as you're going from zero to hero? Well, that's teachers structure their class to meet those competencies. Yeah, that's exactly. I mean, this is basically then their curriculum. This is what they actually work towards. So there's nothing that they do which isn't meeting one of these needs. And as you saw here, this is exactly defining how it should be done. This is really taking away the teacher autonomy to a certain extent. And so therefore CBL or competency-based learning can work very well towards um, something which can be delivered with less facilitation. It's basically, show me your stuff, have you done it? It is standardizing it. But again, their whole framework, I'm obviously only showing you two, two examples of parts of it. I do think it is incredibly detailed, and I really liked it from a technical point of view. Okay. Then we look at teachers. Now, I remember when I was doing work, a lot of work on Mahara, people used competencies and um, evidence for competencies in teacher training. So this was one of the areas which I looked at, and this is a general teaching council in Northern Ireland, which is a different place to Southern Ireland, for those who don't know. <laughs> No, so people are going, oh, you're from Ireland. Is that, is that in the UK? No, we left 100 years ago. <laughs> Scotland, come on, get your act together. Anyway, moving swiftly along. So they've got only 27 competencies. So not that level, which is like the one with sales, which I think had 300, the first one, which we didn't show. And they're, but they're broken into three general areas, which again, now this is nice. This is a more modern framework. It's recent and it's recognizing the whole CPD aspect, or CE, so continuing education, as the thing from continual professional development. And they also have, it's nearly a rubric against it. So you saw there where, 
for competency-based learning, you had these different sort of uh, levels of competency or level of skill set. Here they're looking at sort of phase exemplars or a description around how you expect them to be at different parts of their career. So if we look at, this is the key thing, and this is really where competencies have started to evolve, because it is a continuum. You suddenly don't start from nothing and then become competent at everything, or competent being a teacher. It's constantly evolving. The whole challenge of being a teacher is evolving, and therefore your competency evolves and your requirements behind that evolve. So and it continues throughout the career. I think that's really important to not understand. And this is where competency-based evaluations and assessments yearly, both self and through your industry, can become really interesting. And you probably can't see that very well, but I, I tried to break it into something which was a bit smaller and a bit more manageable. But So it starts off um, and it goes through the competency statement, the aspect of the competency, and then the different phases. So initial teacher education, like know and understand their commitment to learners, colleagues, and other professions. And it moves then through induction, early professional development to continuing professional development, where they have to be, be prepared to proactively fulfill their commitments to learners, etc. So it's this continuum, and it's clearly defined. And when you compare it to some of the early competency frameworks from 10, 15, even 20 years ago, they were much more yes, no. They, they lacked this depth, this richness in understanding of what frameworks and competency and CPD really can be. And if we just take one of them, I mean, you can monitoring the, the pupil's progress. Again, you've got these phases. And I think it, it recognizes that what teachers need to be doing at each stage. So you could look at a teacher and nearly identify where they are on each competency. Are they still, still at the induction phase? Because maybe they haven't had the chance to explore that aspect of their, of their ability or of their skill set in that role. And that's one of the, th the key things. Just because you have this competency framework, it doesn't mean that you're going to be able to develop every aspect of it every year. When once you qualify or once you're being continually um, developing yourself, because not every job is the same. So for example, a pharmacist working in a pharmacy versus industrial research or a hospital, they're completely different in what they do on a daily, day, on a daily basis. So, oops, come on. Um, I'll briefly go through this one. This is another interesting one. This is used, um, the CMALT is ALT, it's the Association of Learning Technologists in the UK. And this is their sort of professional standards framework for becoming a CMALT, sort of a, a registered learning or a certified learning professional. And, but it's peer-based, so it's introducing that other aspect. It's not university-based, but it is. It's a peer-based framework where you're actually creating the equivalent of an e-portfolio, but against this whole competency system and professional values and so on. And again, it's about what type of evidence you produce against it. But again, it's these sort of phases or these levels. So if you were to look at when they actually then talk about it, it's like how to write the CPD, because this is where it's used on an ongoing basis post-graduation. And again, it's, it's very clearly, and reflection is a key part of this, so it's not as, it's not, this is where it's well beyond grades as such. Now, one of the ones which I was um, involved in, um, one of my clients came to me, Gavin, we've got um, this master's in pharmacy, and every, every year these, these students go out into the workplace as part of their master's, and we have this competency framework that they have to um, self-assess against up to six times a year. And their tutors have to assess them six times, up to six times a year. So I had a look at this document, and it's, this is a, it's a very mature, it's a recent framework, but it's driven from the PSI, which is a, it's a regulatory one. And they've got a very, um, a very rich bit of research behind it, but they break down a pharmacist into nice six set areas. And then when they go into that, each one of them has a component, set of competencies. And then each one of those competencies has a set of behaviors. So I think there's around 132 behaviors in total. But the behaviors are, are quite nicely done. So demonstrate a patient-centered approach. 
But if you then look at the other few frameworks I, we sort of looked at, okay, how, did, how do you then assess that? So they, they're sort of halfway between the two different systems of, of assessment on this, and this is for the, the work placement phase. So whether they are rarely meeting, whether they're sometimes, mostly, or they're doing it consistently. So literally, um, six, so let's say six times a, a year, the, the learner goes in and he chooses a drop down for every single one of these. Now there's not really many creative ways this can be visually enticing. I mean, ultimately it's a spreadsheet. 132, choosing what they are. And you obviously have to reflect on it, so it takes time. And, but when the, the student has done it, then the tutor can see what the student has done, and then they put in what they believe the student has achieved, and then they can discuss it. And this is in phases. And the very last one is a summative one, where they both sit down and talk about it at the same time. So, because, and this was done in Moodle, so we built a custom thing for them, because Moodle doesn't really do competencies currently in this way. They could have used outcomes, it would have been very difficult to have the students being able to assess at this level. But one of the reasons that they were using, they wanted to do it in Moodle, was they wanted to be able to leverage the whole Moodle logging and reporting systems within it. And so then this is actually how they were able to demonstrate to the students on a domain competency and behavior level, how they were able to develop their skill set over a year. So that you could literally see and compare it between the student and the tutor. So that they were able to see where they are in a sort of a, a radar based um, compared to the others. And then at the end of it, they just dump the summative stuff out of it and they use that for the regulatory reporting and so on. So, um, any thoughts or questions so far? How does it show up in Moodle? Well this, is, well, this is the Moodle activity. So, basically, the way that they did this one was they um, have every tutor and student in a group by themselves with different roles, and that role has different capabilities. So a student will go in and he will fill in their, um, their assessment and then a tutor will go in and see what students they have and be able to go in and then continue it. And if they have to swap tutors, you just put a different tutor into the group and so on. So it becomes a, it was just an activity. And they wanted it within Moodle rather than building a standalone tool, which probably would have been a lot cheaper and easier because they currently use Moodle for their whole masters. They, all of their courses, all of their tuition and assessment is done through Moodle. So they wanted it to be done that way. So that was just an example of, um, again, if you have a framework, and at the moment, Moodle doesn't have something, although gonna come into that in a moment. Now, any other questions before I move on? Everyone still awake? No, okay. Yeah, I mean, frameworks are one of the most interesting aspects of education. Okay, a, a few chuckles. So. I can't take it anymore. I'm out of here. Where's the pub? Um, I'm so going to need to get us in a minute. Anyway, so um, one of the interesting things that I've seen, that even, when, even if you don't use competencies within your course, I believe you can. But what do you use them for? So one of the institutions that I have also done work with have started looking at, it's like these business readiness or workplace readiness skills. And these are just some examples. So. Every institution probably has their own set of 10 or 12 of these. What a student should be when they graduate, apart from their qualification. These are just things that they have picked up along the way. Um, you know, make a cup of coffee, tea, get the paper, you know, the important things. Um, and so these are just some of the examples. And it's becoming much more important because businesses are looking for this. So even though the grades are what the modules give the students, one of the areas that's now being actively looked at, and especially in Europe, is using competencies to report on these kind of soft skills, which are really valuable to give a report to the student to say, this is how you have progressed. And if you think of that, um, that sometimes, rarely, always kind of um, scale of how they demonstrate these, that's the kind of thing you're looking at. Some use badges for these. Um, but I, I know quite a few who are looking forward to see what Moodle does with regard to competencies for that. So what about Moodle? Well, Moodle has Moodle outcomes. Who here has been using Moodle outcomes in their, in their courses? One, two, do I see three? 
four, five, okay. Going once, six, six there. Going once, going twice, sold to the lady in the corner. Um, so I love Moodle outcomes. I think they're absolutely brilliant. Um, it is a start, and you, you, but you can still do a lot with them already by assigning them into different, um, different as, um, assessments and activities and stuff. And I, I think that people just don't think about them because they are graded. They do, they do block up the grade book a little bit. But there's ways around that too. Because, I mean, if you see here, you can, did they show up just right beside any of the actual items within it? So and that's, that's what they look like at the moment. So you also have a separate outcomes report, um, which, you, which you can look at as well. And when you actually come to grade them, so rather than just having the grade points, you can actually then have these drop downs for whatever scales you have selected for the outcomes. And of course, outcomes can have different scales for each one. But at the moment, there's a piece of work and a bit of research going on about competency based learning for Moodle. So I thought I'd just drop this in here. So there's a specification on Moodle dots, and there's a discussion on the specification and the requirements around it. And there's also a survey. Martin, is that survey still ongoing? Okay. Uh, in fact, uh, I've been to talk about it this morning, but... Uh, Do you want to, very quickly, okay. to explain wh where it is at the moment, or...? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, I think one of the key things is, even if you just look at the examples I've shown you, competencies can be used in so many different ways. And so having a robust framework management within Moodle will then give plug-in developers an opportunity to how to leverage those competencies in different areas. Uh, so, and... That's really it. I just wanted to zip through this. I can always jump back. I'm, how much time do I have left? Quite a bit, actually. Minutes. Eight minutes. Okay. Well, um, I'll zoom, jump back up and I'll give you one of the others. That includes Q&A. Well, that's fine. Well, if anyone has a question you want to ask now before I go through one of these. Anyone else got any questions? Anyone got any, got any thoughts? Does it frighten you? Scares the hell out of me. Can you just imagine having to? Let's go up to this one here. So, this is um, one from 2003, which is a CPSA initiative at the Sales Institute. And so, each one of these then has a set of competencies for it. And then you drop down another level, and it's got another four, five, six. And then you drop down another level. So. The pharmacy one had three levels, 132. This one has four levels. <laughs> and the poor sales guy has to prove all of that. They've got enough on their plate selling. But it's, a, it's an interesting one. I mean, obviously, I would imagine that's 12 years old. I haven't seen an updated version. But one of the reasons I showed this one here was this is a recent research-based one where they're starting to try and make it look pretty, but actually it's still got the same amount of areas. But it does look pretty, doesn't it? <laughs> but if you start counting all those little areas, there's lots of them, that, there's lots of them there. But which shows that salespeople are just really multifaceted and incredibly talented in so many areas. Um, so, go on, questions, please. No, fine. Well, you see, that's the thing. Sometimes that's not possible. So, for example, um, if you take about the sales guy, a lot of those are practical ones, and so therefore those competencies actually might be assessed in the workplace. It might be something where um, a, a sales, that the mentor of a sales guy will have a form when he's sitting in on a sales call or a sales visit, and he's filling in this form to say that the guy has, yes, he asked that question, yes, he did need the analysis correctly, yes, he used reflective um, practice in, in that, and yes, he returned, got a sales quote, he did all these different behaviors during it. 
So a lot of them in these frameworks are not something which you have evidence for apart from somebody else's word. In the ones where you self-assess, again, that's not really an evidence-based. So it's a good question. It's a question is, is there activities in Moodle which can represent them? So maybe an offline assignment, or an assignment which is, has its information taken offline? I don't know. Yeah. Um, just for self reference learning, uh, especially in you know, practicing people who are in. Yeah. Well, I have seen um, occasions where they actually have done self assessment, and then based on that self assessment, it actually then shows up okay, these are the six weakest areas that you have. This is what you should try and focus on. So it creates a dynamic learning plan or individualized learning plan for a student for the coming year. And I think that's one of the really strong areas for it. And that's actually, I think, where the CBL within Moodle could work well, because then they can record evidence against those. And I would also have something that indicates the strengths to help promote that mentorship. Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, again, that's about once you have a framework management system that can manage these multiple levels and what they're called, like some are domains, some are categories, some are competencies, some are behaviors, some are, you know, Every, every single one of these, depending on what culture, depending on what specialization, they're all called different things. Anyone else? Um, well, the, basically the way that the Moodle framework is being proposed at the moment is that you would just be able to create a spreadsheet to upload the framework into Moodle and then decide how that is to be used. Just because, I mean, a framework, as I said, can be used for learning, can be used for evaluation or assessment, depending what plugins and what other stuff is around it. And that's part of the survey. So I strongly suggest read the specification. Take part in the discussion. If you use competencies, it's really important that the different levels are all contributed in there. And take part in the next survey. I think it's very valuable. I mean, it's a clear example of where Moodle is, and Moodle HQ, and Martin, keep your ears closed, actually is, is actively demanding from the community, help direct us. Because they're not, they, they aren't using competencies on a daily basis. Seven of you here are within your industry, within your within your institutions and organizations. So you're the ones who need to pass back that expertise. Yeah, I think actually, I mean, that's where I think it's really important that once you have that framework concept in there, it's then people can leverage it much better. So, for example, in that visualization tool I showed you, we had to build our own competency framework management system into Moodle. So when they create the activity in the Moodle course, they upload the full framework as a CSV just within the one activity. So they can literally have, and again, because in pharmacy, you have core competencies, and then you also have specialities now as, coming in as well, so that you could have four activities in the Moodle course with different frameworks if you wanted to. So we won't need to do that. After Moodle has implemented it, we'd be able to just point at that framework over there, please, which would have made the development half the cost. And I think that's the key. It's when it's there, it's like a foundation stone for you to go, I want to use it this way, and then build it. So, and. This is the page. I mean, I'm going to put all these links. I'm going to tweet them out now in a moment anyway. But um, this literally goes through as Martin. Oops. I guess if I do that one. Nope. Here. Duplicate. Hold on. Yeah. Where is your, your function? Oh, it's function eight. Duplication. There you go.
Okay. So. Cross your fingers. There we go. Oh, there we go. So this is, for example, what Martin was talking about there, that these are just, it's a specification and an example um, of how people could upload it. So this is where it might be CBL, where they're uploading evidence to support their claim that, hey, I got that competency and here's my proof, or this is the assignment that I did which proves I did it. So it's again, but that's just one, one way. It could be a self-assessment tool that you build. It could be anything. So read through it. This is, it's meaty. I mean, if you look here, there's a lot in it. But if competencies is your game, invest the time. Okay, anyway, hopefully that didn't bore you too much. Thank you. Thank you, Gavin.